Independência Israel! Bem-vindo à Independência Israel! Happy Independence Day, Long Israel! Eu estou lendo a minha dog em Israel! Dnei um nisso de Israel! Happy Independence Day, Israel. Israel, herzlichen Glückwunsch zum Unabhängigkeitstag. Ein gesegende Unabhängigkeitstag, Israel. Manigayang Aro Nakaleya an Israel. Israel, Tudi Chinyel, Hallo! Waka Nui Nui Vinaka, Nisinga, Nituba Kaikoya, e Israel. Hiba, Itzanasis, Faiba, Israel. Sotantra Divaski, Shubaka Munie, Israel. We love you, we stand for you. Shalom everyone and welcome to our weekly ICEJ webinar. And if you're wondering uh, what our topic is and what today is, that uh, little video clip tells you it's Israel's Independence Day, Yam Hatzma'ut. So Shalom from us uh, celebrating Israel uh, and uh, I can tell you uh, from some of the reports, my wife went out last night here in Jerusalem a little bit. My son went with a bunch of friends to Tel Aviv. Israel's coming out of the corona lockdowns. And uh, I think it's a lesson. They're sort of out of the head of a lot of the nations because they're almost 90% vaccinated among all the adults. And uh, they're, they're sort of coming out of corona. But the, the, the streets weren't as crowded as they normally were and all the foam and the, the rubber uh, hammers on the head and all that sort of crazy fun that you get out here at, um, uh, on, on Israel's Independence Day, Yam Hatzma'ut. But the planes were overhead today. I think every, all the Israelis are out in nature, in the parks, barbecuing. It's a big tradition here. We just want to wish everyone a, a happy Israeli Independence Day. And, uh, uh, but we're going to talk today on a particular um, topic regarding Israel's uh, independence on May uh, in um, uh, 73 years ago. Uh, we're going now by the Hebrew calendar uh, on the uh, Western calendar. It's uh, May 14, uh, so that'll be coming up. But uh, today it's Yom Hatzma'ud. It's the Israeli uh, date that we're observing. And uh, in Israel's rebirth, there's a certain role that many Christians play that we want to talk about this today and uh, have uh, a couple of our guests here who have been involved with us in honoring some of the Christians along the way who have really helped with the restoration of Israel. And we just welcome everyone again. So when we talk about the Christian role in Israel's rebirth, I want to share uh, my screen here and just uh, go through a few things here first. Put this on full screen. And uh, when you talk about Christian Zionism, even Prime Minister Netanyahu has acknowledged in his book uh, many years ago, Israel and the Na Among the Nations, that Christian Zionism predates political Zionism founded by Theodore Herzl by at least 100 years, if not more, where there were Christians preaching and believing for the return of the Jews to Israel. And, uh, but then Theodore Herzl, uh, you know, really started the initiative, the, the movement to restore the Jewish people back to their ancient homeland. And one of the key figures uh, in um, uh, helping his movement gain traction was William Heschler, the, um, uh, who was, the, uh, he was a, the chaplain for the British embassy in Vienna 
was the uh, uh, a tutor to some of the royal family in Germany. And uh, so he had all kinds of contacts, both through the British diplomatic corps and among the German uh, Austrian royals. And uh, he read uh, Herzl's book, Judenstadt, went right over, uh, lived a few blocks away, went right over, knocked on his door and said, how can I help? Because he, as a Christian, a strong Christian, uh, a minister, he wanted to be involved in the, uh, you know, this new movement among the Jewish people to help them restore them to their ancient homeland. And Heschler uh, is the one who really became what they, uh, some considered the foreign minister of the Zionist movement. He opened the door for Theodor Herzl to meet with many leaders. And as soon as he had this, this uh, sort of, a, the way the history books put it, it was a bit of a strange little encounter with the German uh, Kaiser um, all the other great powers of Europe thought, well, well, he's got progress with the uh, German Kaiser. Maybe we should uh, start concerning whether we should support this Zionist movement, the idea of establishing a Jewish state. So it became a little competition among some of the powers. And of course, Britain was very, very important in it. We'd also have to mention William Blackstone, who was sort of the leading American Christian Zionist of that day, who compiled even before uh, Herzl's book, Judenstadt and the Zionist movement, he uh, uh, garnered signatures from over 400 hundred prominent Americans on what's called the Blackstone Memorial. It was a very powerful statement on biblical and other humanitarian grounds to restore the Jewish people to their ancient homeland. These are some of the leading figures in uh, within Christianity um, over the last 100, 150 years who've been really involved in the restoration of Israel as a nation. How could we not forget uh, Balfour? We'll talk a little about uh, Lord Balfour today, but this is a photo we took at the 100th centenary of the Balfour Declaration, November 1917. This was 2017 in the Royal Albert Hall in um, uh, London, uh, just a wonderful event. Our uh, president, Dr. Jürgen Bueller, was the uh, main Christian speaker there. And, uh, and we had, uh, it was just a wonderful program. Uh, Balfour is important. Uh, here at the same time of the Balfour Declaration by the British War Cabinet, November, December uh, 1917. This is a, uh, a photo I took at the um, at a reenactment 100 years later of the uh, charge of uh, the uh, British and Australian and New Zealand cavalry, the Anzacs, the cavalry at Beersheba down in southern Israel in the Negev. And uh, a lot of the, the descendants of the original Anzacs come and, and ride in this every year, but it was a big deal at the 100th anniversary of the capture of Beersheba, which really opened the door for General Allenby just a few weeks later to enter Jerusalem and begin British rule here. And then the, uh, the British mandate over Palestine, uh, such the Balfour Declaration committed Britain, Great Britain, to uh, restoring the Jewish people to their land, to the idea of a, uh, um, a Jewish national home here. We'd have to say that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, it seems odd today, but uh, over around the 19, around 1900, the idea, uh, it was the prevailing view, even within the Anglican church in England, that it was time for God to restore the Jews to the land, just as he had said in his Bible, and that England, Britain, with its worldwide empire, was uniquely positioned to help with this. So they committed in the Balfour Declaration to restoring the Jews to their homeland, uh, received from the League of Nations in 1922 a mandate to start building a Jewish state here. A lot of history in between. Conflict started arising with the Arabs. I believe a lot of it was, was uh, 
uh, instigated by anti-Semites within the British mandate authorities and in the foreign office and elsewhere who didn't want to see the land and especially Jerusalem back in the hands of Jews. But the conflict arose and Israel was born in uh, 1948 amidst uh, uh, war, conflict here in the land um, uh, 73 years ago. But the, um, there was, uh, there's certain Christians who played key roles in Israel's rebirth. Uh, and and uh, I think a lot of them are forgotten. And our guests today are going to help us remember them. And the first one that uh, we're going to, uh, we, we can talk about John Henry Patterson who uh, uh, led the first Jewish fighting force in World War I. Uh, we have a nice medallion of the Zion Bukor, which he led, and we'll come back and talk about Patterson in a little bit. But we're now want to talk, uh, begin by talking about the Exodus ship, 1947, uh, a ship bringing British, uh, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, trying to get them to mandate Palestine, and the British blockade, their pro-air policies, they had a low quota, didn't want Jews, uh, survivors of the Holocaust coming into the land uh, because they were favoring the Arabs. And there was a certain Christian on board, John uh, Stanley Grau, a reverend that uh, we wanna first talk about today. I'll stop my share and introduce our guests. First, we have Jerry Klinger, who is the, the um, president and founder of the, um, Amer uh, the Jewish American Society for Historic Preservation. How are you, Jerry? He'll have to unmute. Right now, is it better? Yeah, there we are. And, there we are. And Sam Philippe is uh, an Israeli uh, artist and also has a lot of charitable projects and other businesses going on. And Sam has become a good friend of uh, the Christian Embassy and of Jerry because he's an artist who does a lot. Of, Jerry's in the business of history, finding uh, you know, historic events, people, places, uh, focused mainly on American Jewry and their role in, in, Amer in the Americas. But he got interested in Christians who played a part in Israel's restoration as well. And Sam uh, is uh, working with us to help develop uh, monuments and memorials and such to this. And welcome both gentlemen and uh, happy Yom Hatzma'ut. Thank you. Thanks, Samir. Yeah. Hi, Sam. Okay, Jerry, tell us who was John uh, Stanley Grau? Well, to be honest, I didn't know who he was in the beginning. Yeah. I had been, I had wandered into the Alliance Christian Missionary Cemetery, of course, that's uh, off of um, Rachel Emot in the German colony. The gates were never opened. I happened to go in there and I saw this large tombstone there. I have to admit that I was confused. I didn't know who it was. And so I contacted you. And if you could just guide me a little bit on it. You gave me some advice. I went back, I did the research, and I discovered this incredible story about this Christian who made the difference, possibly with the birth of Israel. John, uh, John Garul was on the Exodus. He was a, a um, Methodist minister. He was asked to be on the Exodus specifically by the Haganah because they had a sense that the Exodus was going to be attacked by the British. And if they tried to tell the story, if Jews tried to tell the story, nobody believes a Jew. But if a Christian minister tells the story of what happened, that was the difference. And it turned out to be exactly the case. So he was the one who told the story to the UNSCOP Commission, told them what happened, and his testimony was believed, and it possibly paved the way for the recognition and for the, uh, rather the recommendation from UNSCOP for the division of the area into two states, one for Palestine and one for Israel. So he made the difference. He, he, uh, he was a minister in, uh, I think, uh, Maryland or from New England, and, but all, serving in Maryland. And he was actually recruited to the ship. He had been 
an activist uh, for a Christian supporter of the Zionist movement. They actually recruited him because they thought if the ship was attacked by the British, he'd be a, a, a good witness. And they were, that was good foresight. Absolutely the case, because they knew if a man of God, a Christian man of God, told what happened, it was hard to refute the story. Yeah, yeah. Now, tell us a little about uh, UNSCOP and why Exodus is, the ship Exodus is so uh, important in this whole story. UNSCOP stands for the United Nations uh, Special Committee on Palestine. What they had done because of the uh, all the problems that existed after 1945 through 1947, there's a lot of tensions going back and forth between the Jews and between the local Arab community and the international community and all the Jewish refugees that existed, um, the survivors really in Europe had nowhere to go and they were trying to get in to some place that wanted them. The world that really didn't want them even after the, after the Holocaust. And there was this tension. So finally, the British said, you know what? We're just going to turn this over to the United Nations. We're going to have a special committee that's going to go. They're going to investigate everything. And they're going to come back with a recommendation. The problem was they stacked the deck with who was going to be on the commission. And initially, they had, uh, the commission had no intention of hearing Jewish testimony for why they were trying to get into the land until the story of the Exodus took place, because the Exodus was the largest effort ever. It was over 5,000 people were squeezed onto a ship designed for about 600. It was a Maryland uh, steamship that used to do honeymoon cruises from Baltimore down to Norfolk and back and forth. It was used a little bit during World War II for, uh, for uh, troop carriers, but um, they squeezed everybody on because they said, we have to get these people in. And the British were not permitting the Jews who were refugees, they had nowhere to go. They were not permitting them to get into the land. So they said, we're going to try and make this big effort, the biggest we've ever done. And they knew, as I said, they knew that unless the story could be told, it was going to get buried by the media. And they needed mm -hmm. this person. They needed Reverend Gaul on board to tell the story. So they gave him a cover. They said, yes, you are part of the effort we're trying to do, but as far as the media is concerned, you're a journalist for the Churchman magazine simply reporting on the story. And he did report on it. Yeah, there's a whole story how he, he witnessed the, the uh, British armed. They had been firing on this ship, the Exodus packed with 4,500 Jewish refugees. Uh, many of them no shoes, barely clothed, and the British uh, were armed to the teeth and they boarded the ship after firing at it and, and there were Jewish boys on there fighting back with potatoes and, and canned food, that's all they had, and he witnessed it all and, and uh, when they arrested everyone, detained them and took them and at Haifa, they saw he was an American they couldn't hold him, but he had, they were still sort of had him under house arrest. He had to, they had to sneak him. The Jewish underground had to sneak him to Jerusalem. There were roadblocks, got him through so that he could talk to Unscop. And the fate of that ship and those refugees, right while that committee was here, I think it was headline news. It was front page news all over, all over the world. What, what are they going to do about these refugees? And it was quite dramatic, Jerry and, and Sam, to think that, that even with the Holocaust being uncovered, that they would treat Jews like this. And I think it, it finally affected the, the committee members themselves, where they would listen to the Jewish people and, and so they could make their case for a state. Now, Jerry, you noted that, that this ship, the Exodus, sort of sank in and to, it just disappeared from the map. What, what happened? What did, what did you, you, you go around trying to, to find important historic events and people and to honor them, but uh, where was the exodus? Well, let me back up a little bit to tell you how dramatic and how severe what happened uh, with the British. 
The Exodus was attacked by a British, um, a series of British naval ships in international waters. Mm -hmm. She wasn't even in anywhere near coastal waters. She was off the coast of Sinai. And um, they demanded that she surrender. Well, of course, she kept on trying to get to the, to the land. She kept on trying to go. So the British put two destroyers on either side of her and began to undulate against her sides. They tried to crush the Exodus and sink her. And, they, and everybody on board knew what that meant. You know, the story in the media the next day would have been tragedy at sea, 4,500 people drowned. Oh, my, this is terrible, terrible, terrible. What they weren't telling them was that the British had every intention of either stopping the ship or sinking the ship. Mm. So when the ship finally stopped, they did throw on board, uh, boarding parties and they came on with guns shooting. They killed people on board. They smashed heads including that of a young American, Bill Bernstein, who was mm -hmm. a volunteer naval officer on board just trying to help the refugees get to the land. Mm. His head was caved in by the British military. Mm. Well, the ship eventually, they had to make a decision. They decided it's either we surrender or they're going to drown us at sea. They surrendered. They came into Haifa Harbor. The ship was offloaded. Everybody who was there as they pulled in, the song they were singing on their lips could be heard from the shore. They were singing the Hatikva. Hmm. And then they pulled everybody off the ship and they put them on new ships, prison ships that ended up back at the camps in Germany. Mm -hmm. That's what the British ended up doing. Now, what happened to the ship itself? The Exodus remained tied up in Haifa Harbor. It was a derelict at this point. She had been smashed badly. She was in horrible condition certainly couldn't be used anymore as a ship. And they were keeping her until the early 50s. They thought maybe they were going to make her into a floating museum until one day, mysteriously, nobody knows how, they said it maybe it was a welder's torch. Whatever the accident was, she burned to the waterline. They pulled out the remains. They sunk her out uh, outside of the harbor area. And, and that's where her remains were. So Sam and I have been working together on a number of projects, and the Exodus was one of the, one of the earliest of the most important stories because there were memorials to the Exodus in the United States, in Germany, in France, in Italy. Ironically, there was nothing in Israel specifically to the most iconic story of the birth of Israel. It's, uh, Ruth Gruber called the Exodus a ship that launched the nation. The story went around the world and just toward people's hearts when they realized the desperation of these human beings trying to find some place that would take them. Mm -hmm. Well, the ship uh, went down and um, I contracted with Sam and we sent out diving crews to try and find her remains. Well, we found other ships, but we did not find the Exodus. Mm -hmm. So we know she's still out there. In she Haifa never wanted to leave. She's mm -hmm. still out there somewhere. She mm -hmm. refuses to leave the land of Israel. <laughs> But uh, we wanted to do a monument. Uh, we want to bring Sam in. But first, uh, I want to share my screen again and show a couple photos here. Uh, again, Calera, if I can share here. Uh, this again is uh, Reverend John Stanley Graul, who uh, was the, uh, I think, a Methodist minister who was on board the Exodus and went and testified to the UNSCOP committee. They wouldn't take Jewish testimony. Here he is, a, a, a Gentile and a, and a Christian, and he went and testified how the ship was attacked and rammed, and they tried to sink it, and it was very impactful in the UNSCOP, the UN committee's decision to uh, uh, recommend the f founding of a Jewish state. Uh, this is his gravestone in the uh, Protestant cemetery on Emek Rephaim here in Jerusalem. And uh, this is how uh, Jerry Klinger and I first met. He, he went there and wanted to know more about him. Who is this guy? And you can see the anchors on his grave uh, and the Exodus 47. And here we have a ceremony when we dedicated the very first monument in Israel to the Exodus, so important in Israel's refounding. This is Natan Sharansky. This is up in the Haifa Harbor in the Port Authority there, the main entrance. 
uh, a nice uh, big ceremony. This is some of the survivors uh, uh, who were on the Exodus sent back, I think first to Cyprus, heading back to Germany. They finally made it in and they came from all over to be part of this ceremony that, uh, that Jerry and Sam and the Christian Embassy helped put together. And here we have uh, Dr. Bueller along with uh, Sam Philippe and Jerry Klinger uh, at the uh, uh, ceremony to unveil this monument. And I hope you can see something of the, um, uh, the, the monument there that uh, Sam Philippe created. It was a big map of Israel with a big anchor up at, uh, in the Haifa area denoting that this exodus was really a main anchor, a main pillar event in the founding of Israel. Okay, and I'll stop the share. And Sam, how are you? H Happy Independence Day. Happy Yom Ma'ut, as we say. Yeah, yeah. Now you've had your barbecue today. Uh, all since last night, several of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I know most Israelis know about the Exodus story, but no one had really done something to to honor this ship and to, you know, lay a marker for it. And uh, it was nice to be involved in it with you. Can you tell us a little about that? Uh, it's true, you know. The in in Israel, many things uh, are, you know, people forget, and the monument. Uh, that they built was stuck somewhere in between Jerusalem and Bechemes, somewhere in the forest, and nobody goes there. And it was important for us to bring it out so many visitors can see it and learn about it and uh, remember the story. And I think the most difficult part for Jerry and myself was to find the right location. Uh, we negotiated with the mayor of Haifa at that time, and uh, he didn't really cooperate. He didn't want to give us uh, the right uh, location. But in the end, we actually built a monument exactly where the ship docked, right at the mm. Haifa Harbor. Mm. And later, they opened a cruise line taking tourists all the way from that particular spot all the way to Akko. And in 2019, they had thousands of people traveling from Haifa port to Akko and visiting the, the site and learning about it. Now, it's not only Israelis, it's also uh, the uh, Arabs that uh, are part of this country and they know nothing. And as they, they go to Akko, uh, they travel, they see it and they learn a little bit about uh, this heroic uh, story. And of course, all the tourists that we expected them uh, to see it. Uh, unfortunately, 2020 and now uh, we have no more tourists, mm -hmm. but they'll be back. Mm -hmm. So once we found the place, uh, it was important to make it very visible. And Jerry, my friend, he always tell me, Sam, I want something that people can understand and not just try to make interpretation. And the most obvious thing was a, a huge bronze map that I hand sculpted of Israel set on Jerusalem rock, Jerusalem stone. And on the map where Haifa is, where the Gulf of Haifa, I placed an uh, anchor, which is identical to the one that was on the boat. And like Jerry said, we tried to find any relics from the, the boat, but uh, apparently the boat that was sunk they built uh, the part of the harbor on it. So it, it was very difficult uh, to find a thing and we didn't. But now it's a very clear monument. Anyone can go there immediately. He sees the, the map, the anchor, and the explanation in three languages, in Hebrew, in English, and in Arabic as well, telling the story of the boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, Sam, do uh, do Israelis uh, know uh, uh, about uh, John Graul? Do they know anything about him? Do they know and appreciate the 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 Christian role? Some of these figures we've been talking about, like Heschler, Blackstone, Patterson, who have all played a key role at different moments in Israel's rebirth. 
To be honest with you, they really don't. And most Israelis don't. Many Israelis don't even know the Exodus and they mix it up with Altalena, which is a completely different story, mm-hmm. but uh, they don't. And I think that part of our mission together is to bring it to, to their attention because if it wasn't for the Christian friends of Israel uh, all along the history, uh, the Raul uh, on the boat of Exodus and then all the Machalnik, uh, I think Israel wouldn't be today where it was. I mean, mm-hmm. the Machal people, a lot of them volunteer, Gentiles, they actually set the, the Israeli army, the first... Uh, uh, Air Force and all the, the, the tanks unit, all of that, they, they are the one that started it and taught the Israelis uh, how to continue. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all remember the, the, the names, uh, you know, of all these uh, wonderful volunteers that came. And I think this is our mission, is to, to show that... Uh, you know, Israel is a miracle, but it's not only a miracle of the Jewish people. It's also a miracle of the Christian people mm-hmm. as well. Yes. Uh, what uh, Sam Philippe is referring to, that uh, in Israel's war of independence, uh, once they declared independence in, in May of 73 years ago, there were a lot of volunteers from abroad, m- most of them Jewish, but there were quite a few Christians who came to try and serve as volunteers in the IDF or just in different uh, emergency rescue position. And uh, we did a monument to them at Ammunition Hill in Jerusalem. Right. It was Jerry Klinger uh, who really started taking the initiative on this. And Sam, uh, they've had a wonderful partnership and we've been a part of it to honor the, the Christian Mahalniks. Uh, as well, that were part of the uh, the effort to win Israel's independence in 1948. I got a, f- a photo I'll show in a few minutes of the ceremony where we, I don't have a photo of that monument or the plaque there, but these are plaques that where Israelis go to Ammunition Hill all the time, and yes. now they can see a plaque there that says Christians were involved in helping right. Israel uh, win the battle. I want to say, uh, David, that we find all along the way with the different projects that we do that we're running into difficulties with the, with the Israelis. I don't think that it's out of evil. I think it's just out of ignorance. Mm-hmm. And we have to work very hard to make things happen. I mean, I'm sure Jerry can tell you uh, other projects that we're involved and in, it was always difficult and instead of them just giving us a hand uh, and Jerry is such a wonderful man and you guys in the Christian Embassy you come forth and you you help you ready to pay for it and, and to make it happen and we run into all sorts of bureaucracy and I'm sure if you ask Jerry he can give you some uh, highlights of what this mayor said, and once this one said, uh, all along the way, and that's uh, that's part of my fight. Again, I become fighting the the different authorities rather than just concentrating my artwork, which is yeah. easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll talk a little more about your artwork and show some of it in just a few minutes because we've had a, a long and very uh, very nice, uh, wonderful partnership with uh, Sam Philippe as a fine artist. He's had incredible uh, projects that he's been assigned. Wait, now you're, you're designing a menorah for the new big synagogue in, in Dubai. Can we talk right. about in, that? Uh, it's gonna be in Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Uh, uh, we can talk about it, but- It's uh, a project the Pope but, actually started. Uh, I, 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 yeah. Right. It was it uh, was initiated by the Vatican by the Pope when he was visiting yeah. there, yeah. Uh, and I already made the design of uh, the menorah. It's going to be like 21 feet, and it's going to be the menorah of peace. It yeah. would uh, mention in three languages the word peace on the bottom of it. Okay. Now I, I'm going to go back to Jerry for a little more history. He's the historian, as I do. I'm going to share my screen again. 
and uh, and uh, let me just takes a minute here to make this full screen. This again is the Exodus Memorial in Haifa Harbor. That's uh, Jerry and and uh, Sam uh, at the dedication of it. Uh, but you can't think about rebirth of Israel in 1948 without also talking about, say, Harry Truman. Uh, um, who was uh, gave American recognition. He was a Baptist and it's a long story, but he recognized Israel within 11 minutes of their uh, declaration of independence uh, or as of midnight that night when it was to come effective. And this is Reverend William Hall, who was a minister from Canada based here in Jerusalem. Many people don't know the story, but he came uh, and met with the uh, Justice Rand. His father was an attorney uh, who knew Justice Rand, the head, he was a, a, a justice on the Canadian Supreme Court and was the head of the UN committee, the UNSCOP committee in 1947 that eventually recommended partition. Reverend Hall had lived here in Jerusalem for around 10, uh, years already. He knew the conflict and he went and made the Jewish case and the biblical case for Israel's restoration to Justice Rand. Because Canada is a Commonwealth country and you're dealing with the abuses of Britain against the Jewish people here, uh, he really uh, uh, had a lot of persuasive uh, effect on Justice Rand and Justice Rand was considered the conscience of the committee. And when he started saying the British have really uh, breached the, their obligations under the mandate. They're not treating the Jewish people fairly. The Jews should have a state. Uh, th this reverend, a Christian Zionist here in Jerusalem at the time, uh, had a big impact on him. And we, we really would need to mention him. And uh, uh, Jerry, um, anyone else we need to talk about in those days? Uh, Hall well, an interesting figure. He later, when Eichmann was captured and brought here and tried in Jerusalem in 61, um, he, the, the, there were Catholics who were serving, a, a Catholic chaplains who, some of them, uh, you know, from Nuremberg, you give these Nazis, even though they're war criminals, you still give them a, a chaplain before you execute them. And here Israel had to find someone and this William Hall was a Protestant. Uh, Eichmann considered himself a Protestant and, and uh, he went and spent many hours with him, wrote a book about Eichmann. So this Hall was an interesting figure and he, he had a lot to do with the UN committee changing its mind uh, about a Jewish state. Well, let me, let me add something. Uh, you showed the picture from the Royal Albert Hall in uh, 2017, in which I was privileged, of course, to be, be there with you for that particular event. But I just want to give you a little quote from uh, Lord Balfour, who spoke at the same location in 1920. Now we're dealing with about uh, 100, 101 years ago. And it was something Sam alluded to, you've alluded to, that I thoroughly came to understand and value. And it's a very simple thing. He said, we are partners in this great enterprise. Yes. This is not a one side thing or the other side thing. We are partners, we do this together. And he went on to say that if we fail you, you cannot succeed. If you fail us, you cannot succeed. It's mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So when we're dealing with the story of the birth of Israel, it's this, it's this strange partnership. And there's two terms I'd like to share with you. And uh, it's, you know, Hebrew, Yiddish, one is a mikre, which you can say roughly it's a coincidence. Things happen, it's coincidence. But what if there's a coincidence once, twice, three times? Different people keep on coming and, on, upon the scene, curiously enough, at the right moment to make the crucial differences, whether it's going to be the Reverend on the Exodus, whether it's going to be Reverend Hall, whether it's going to be um, Ambassador Rand, Whoever the story is, and we should talk also about Granados too, yes. Ambassador Granados. But oh. um, then we use the term and said, is it a mikre or is it beshelt? Beshelt means 
Is it something that was intended? That's something a lot of people might be uncomfortable considering that maybe the events that occurred when Christian and Jews came together to try and give uh, help the rebirth of the state of Israel again, was it a coincidence or was it something intended? So all I'm going to suggest is that all the people we're talking about suddenly come onto the scene at exactly the moment needed to do what was necessary to bring the state into existence again. Yes. So, yeah. you know, I mentioned briefly about um, Ambassador Granados. He was, the, he was a member of UNSCAP. He was from Guatemala. He was a humanitarian, well-recognized. So when Reverend Gaul literally had to be smuggled from Haifa by Teddy Kolek, who was Haganah at the time later to be mayor of Jerusalem, he was smuggled to Jerusalem to tell what was happening. The British freaked out because they knew that the story was going to get out. They had to stop him all along, all along the road, everywhere, were roadblocks searching for him. They managed to get him to Jerusalem. And the person they took him to see initially in the middle of the night That's right. was, was Ambassador Granados. Because they knew that at least he would be fair to hear the story. And he heard the story and he went, oh, my God. And he assembled other people. And that's when the difference was made. Because they heard the story. And Granado said to the rest of the committee, you got to hear this. So all of these events were happening. And they were going to leave the next day. So if they hadn't have gotten the reverend there to tell the story, the opportunity would have been missed. All of these things were happening at that point. So I can I can jump ahead on the story, but I'll, I'll let you guide as to what you want me to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Ambassador Granados uh, also was a very, very important figure. And the, I think this is sort of the story of the history of Christian Zionism. Those of us Christians who support Israel uh, for many decades, uh, for 150 years or so, there were individuals that were in the right place at the right moment to do something to really help. And in mo more modern times over the last 50 years, the uh, you know the we've gotten organized where we're now with big organizations that are doing you know working to help build the state of Israel that it's here. There are still individuals who are in key places, but it's such a uh, collective effort the, these days through these organizations. But Granados was a Christian diplomat from Guatemala who, uh, he lay, after he served on UNSCOP, he, he wrote a book about it. I think it's called Birth of a Nation or something uh, uh, where he said, my goodness, they only started the, the city of Tel Aviv uh, 30 years ago and look what the Jews have done here. And if the British weren't, uh, holding them back on buying land and developing and, and, and hindering them, they could do so much more here. And he then was the, um, after UNSCOP, he got appointed as Guatemala's ambassador to the UN. And he was at the UN in 1949 when uh, Israel was admitted as a member. Um, and, and, but he was, um, uh, he was there when they were debating and um, on May 14th, what to do that would do some sort of take some sort of uh, emergency measure to stop the birth of uh, a Jewish state. And uh, Truman recognized Israel at 611 Eastern time that evening, midnight here. And uh, it was announced there in the middle of the UN debate. And uh, Granados was the second person. He hears the announcement that the U.S. is recognized. So he said Guatemala is the second country to recognize Israel. And people wonder why Guatemala moved their embassy to Jerusalem recently. They have a whole history that really dates back to this man, that there's a legacy there of their special connection to Israel that's still uh, going on. Let's uh, go back to a couple of photos here. Uh, um, Jerry, you just talked. Uh, let me, let me see. If not uh, here. Trying to go back to it. Uh, 
Okay. We talked about Patterson for a minute. He, he was the one who, uh, um, he, he uh, led the first Jewish fighting force, the Zion Mule Corps in World War I. Uh, and and uh, Jerry Klinger will talk about uh, his story in just a minute because you oversaw, you started the initiative and then got uh, us and Sam Philippe involved for him to be reburied with his troops here in the land of Israel. Uh, and then after uh, Hall, uh, this is the Mahalnik ceremony, Mayor, uh, Jerusalem Mayor near Barkat, uh, honoring a monument we put up honoring the Christians in, among the Mahalniks, the volunteers who came to fight in 1948. Uh, here is a uh, what we call the Nehemiah Award, which uh, J uh, Sam Philippe, the artist, does for us the, for the embassy every year. I gave it uh, in a, recently to Senator John Kyle for uh, it's an annual award for Christian Zionists who really distinguish themselves in the rebuilding of Israel and Jerusalem. Uh, here is the, uh, this is the Cyrus Cylinder in the British Museum in London, which was uh, when Cyrus, he, he um, it's a very famous artifact. He's the one, uh, the Persian king, who allowed the Jews to come back and build their temple. And when Donald Trump uh, started uh, um, recognizing Jerusalem, moving the U.S. embassy here, many compared him to, say, a modern day Cyrus. And Sam Philippe designed an award in solid gold here that we gave. This is to, this is to President Jimmy Morales when he came to move the Guatemala embassy uh, to Jerusalem. We're giving this to all the heads of state. Uh, this uh, Cyrus Award, we call it a, a gold replica of the Cyrus Cylinder that any head of state of any country that moves their embassy to Jerusalem, we're giving them an award that Sam Philippe designed. This is a design uh, similar to uh, Exodus Memorial, where we've got the land of Israel with uh, that sort of uh, ball of Jerusalem being built right there in the center of the country. We gave this at our feast a few years ago to some of the paratroopers who uh, had liberated the city of uh, uh, the old city of Jerusalem in 1967. There were some of them that we honored at our Feast of Tabernacles, and that was a wonderful moment. I think that's the end of the slideshow. These are some of the, some, this is examples of some of the work we've done together. And uh, while we've got a little time, Jerry, tell us about uh, John Henry Patterson. He's quite a figure. He's another important Christian uh, involved in the uh, restoration of Israel over the last 100 years. John Henry Patterson was the Christian commander initially of the Zion Mule Corps in 1917. Um, you have to remember what the psychology was that existed in those days. They did not, the British in did not want to have a Jewish fighting unit. There had never been one in 2000 years, but the desperation of the situation was such, they needed to have a Jewish fighting force to supplement British efforts. So the first one they put together was uh, organized actually in Egypt. And these were refugees from Palestine. These were Jews that had lived under the Ottomans and the Ottomans said, we don't want you, get out of here. We're gonna either imprison you or leave immediately. So they ran for their lives. Many of the men ended up in Egypt. They were organized into the Zion Mule Corps under the command of John Henry Patterson. And it turned out Patterson, of course, was a Christian Zionist who was raised on the Bible. So he was thrilled at the possibility of this, uh, of this opportunity. Well, the first place they were sent was Gallipoli. Mm. It was, Gallipoli was one of the, some people would like to say it was a uh, strategic retreat by the British. It was a disaster. Mm. They tried to invade the soft underbelly of Turkey. They thought 130,000 men lost their lives on both sides in this effort. And they pulled back. The Zion Mule Corps took heavy casualties. And when they came back for, um, 
you know, to back to Cairo, they said, we have no more use for you. Problem was the British still had not won the war. They were in trouble and they needed to have uh, men. The Jews were, were reluctant to join the British army. Why? Because the British were allied with the Russians and the Russians were notorious anti-Semites. So a logical question was, why should we send our sons to the Western Front to die to help the Russians who hate us, who are anti-Semites and will try and do terrible things to us? So the logic became was, if you could create a fighting force to liberate Palestine from the Ottomans, that was something the, the Jews were more than willing to do. And Patterson was the logical commander for that operation. He was supported by Zev Jabotinsky, by a number of actions on the part of the British cabinet. And so the, so the uh, Jewish legion was born, but the British didn't want to call it the Jewish legion because that was politically incorrect. So it became the 38th Royal Fusiliers. Mm -hmm. They marched them across the Sinai and they made a crucial participation in the liberation of Jerusalem 2,000 years later. And when the city was finally liberated, the British had one more little dig. They would permit British to go in, but no Jews, even if they were in British uniforms. Mm -hmm. So they sent the Jews across the Jordan River to help liberate the parts on the Eastern side, because the intent was when the creation of the state was not just for a Jewish state, but the idea of the Jewish state was to benefit all people, Christian, Arab, Jew, in one peaceful community that could grow and blossom if they were given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So Patterson was the commander of that force. And because he was so defensive of his soldiers and they fought very well with distinction, the British officers still resented him deeply. He was the only officer to go through World War I and was never given a promotion for service, ever. And as soon as the war was over, they promptly had him retired, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. But Patterson was closely involved with uh, Zev Jabotinsky, and, they were, and he was the Christian face of the support for the Zionist movement under the revisionists. Well, Jabotinsky had a secretary who was, uh, worked for him. His name was Ben Sion Netanyahu. That was Prime Minister Netanyahu's father. Ben Sion and John Henry Patterson became very, very close. So when Ben Sion and his wife had their first child, they were thinking, who should they name as the godfather? Who should they name in appreciation for all the services done, they named the child Yonatan, Jonathan. Yonatan Netanyahu, Yoni Netanyahu, who died at Entebbe, is named in honor of his godfather, John Henry Patterson. Yeah, there's some sort of chalice that the Netanyahu family has that is from uh, John Henry Patterson. He was an Irish Protestant, quite a figure that uh, he, he was already famous because he was the great lion hunter of, uh, of what, Savaro or something in, in Western Kenya. They were building the railway and, and, and he was brought in to shoot some lions that had, had killed about a hundred people as they're working on the railway. And he was very famous already. He went around uh, lecturing later in the thirties and all with, um, uh, um, with Netanyahu, with Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky was a great speaker, but everyone wanted to be there to, to meet the, the great lion hunter of Africa, John Henry Patterson, who really, uh, you know, for us, his big, big impact was, was uh, putting together the first Jewish fighting force since the Bar Kokhba revolt. And, uh, and even the Net Net Netanyahu family honors him. Quite interesting. Can I just add one thing that yes. as World War II got closer, John Henry Patterson came forward again and he says the Jews want to fight the Nazis. They want to have their own unit to fight the Nazis. 
And of course, the same problem. They resisted. The, uh, the British resisted having a Jewish fighting force. And he called for a Jewish army that uh, to get out there and fight the Nazis. Yeah. Eventually, that led to the creation of the Jewish Brigade, who mm -hmm. actually did fight in North Africa and Italy. And it was a direct link to Christian John, uh, John Patterson and his efforts to show that Jews and Christians together can make a difference. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the, I mean, the, the Haganah, the Jewish underground, and even the IDF, uh, the, the Patterson's forces were really the precursor to them. He, he really was the father uh, in a way of the IDF. He and Ord Wingate, uh, another British Christian figure. So uh, we just want to honor them. Jerry, I, I, you know, it, what's, what was really touching for me is that uh, Patterson had wanted in his, I think it's in his will, he said, I want to be buried with my Jewish troops in the land of Israel. And no one knew where he was buried. And you are such a detective, an historic detective. Just give us the, the short version of that story and how you were involved in him being reburied in, in Israel. Well, when I read that was his desire and what he wanted to do, the question was, we had no idea where his remains were. We didn't know. There, but again, a partnership. A Christian by the name of Todd Young from Canada joined with me in the search. And we found his remains in, a, in the Rosedale Cemetery outside of Los Angeles. And we began the effort. It took us three and a half years to do, but we began the effort to finally transfer his remains back to Avichail, which is the uh, Moshav of the, of the soldiers of the Jewish Legion, and have him reburied with his men as per his wishes. Mm -hmm. At that program, as we did it, Prime Minister Netanyahu was officiating mm -hmm. because this was something extremely personal to him and to many of the people that were there to honor this man who had done so much to help bring Israel about. This, this is quite an interesting story. I mean, there's, a, there's even a Hollywood movie uh, um, uh, about uh, Patterson's life, uh, fi you know, shooting lions in India uh, with Val Kilmer in it, playing his role. But, he, you know, he was an important his, historic figure, but sort of forgotten. And Jerry Klinger found his cremains at a cemetery at the end of LAX runway in Los Angeles, quite interesting, and had to really move heaven or earth, even here in Israel, to bring in this sort of godfather of the IDF to, to fulfill his wish of being uh, buried with his troops here in Israel in this uh, Avihau, uh, which is a small community near Netanya, where there's a, a, a special cemetery for some of the soldiers who died in the first world war, some of the Jewish soldiers. We just want to thank again, Sam, anything to add here? Uh, we just so much appreciate the, the partnership we have with both of you gentlemen. You help open doors for us, help get some of these things done, but even fighting bureaucracy and, and whatever the powers that be sometimes to really honor these figures. You got to move heaven and earth. Sam? It's true, we are moving heaven on earth for the future generation. And, you know, Jerry uh, always tell me, I want to know, I want people to know in 500 years from now what was going on. Yeah. And we are like the, we say in Hebrew, shlichim, the messengers to bring all these stories uh, to the people using artwork, using media. You know, you, your media is powerful and uh, Jerry uh, has been writing all about it all along. And I try to do the most here in uh, the land of Israel. Uh, I do want to mention something. You mentioned Guatemala and I think Jerry should mention it uh, as well. We are trying to reach out to other countries and the first one would be Guatemala. Why, Jerry, why won't you tell them a little bit about what you're doing in Guatemala right now? 
what I'm doing, what we're doing. What we are, we are doing, correct. What we're doing. Uh, right. Sam created a beautiful interpretive sculpture of Anne Frank. It's, mm. uh, she's sitting at a desk. It's in a uh, it's artistically created attic looking environment. And we placed, and I thought of this and I said, this is a perfect interpretive media, not just about the Holocaust, because Anne was a child. And she was a little girl that was a victim of bigotry, hatred, and ignorance. So we put up a uh, Anne Frank sculpture that Sam had made. We put it outside of Motley Adumim. And it is known as the Children's Human Rights Memorial. And Anne Frank is the interpretive theme there. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful support letter from the president of Israel uh, to do these things. So I reached out to the most logical country, the first one to really who wanted to receive it, was Guatemala. Next week, I think Sam is shipping the sculpture and it's going to be placed in the UNESCO city of Antigua. Yes. So we are moving a sculpture of Anne Frank, the Children's Human Rights Memorial, because that's what our focus is. Children are the victims of all this hatred, bigotry, and ignorance. And we have to remember it's the children that are the future. So they have to be protected. So we're moving this sculpture and it's going to be placed and dedicated in this World Heritage Site of Antigua in the country of Guatemala. And I, I think next week it's going out, right, Sam? You have to unmute, Sam. Yeah, it's going out next week. It's a very large sculpture. It's gonna weigh more than a ton with the stone that we that I created also in Spanish and in English, telling the story. And, and like Jerry said, it's not only about the Holocaust, about and it's about the children. Uh, and Frank has been a symbol uh, worldwide. Everybody knows the story of Anne Frank, so that's how we choose. We chose her. Uh, we do have a wonderful uh, collaboration with the president, president of Israel, President Rivlin. Uh, actually, Jerry had uh, was invited to visit him in 2020, uh, and that would be something for maybe later this year. The monument in Male Domim is right by the schools. There's like four or five schools, one after another. I think that's, uh, by the way, the meeting point where Nicole and I always meet there to do all the beautiful AIDS projects that you do in Male Domim. Uh, and the, the one to go to Mala is being shipped next week. And actually, we are looking into more sites. Uh, we are, I, I just got back from Addis Ababa. We're thinking to place one there. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are looking, and uh, anyone that uh, can think that it would be appropriate in his country. Uh, Jerry, uh, uh, I think, would be very happy to collaborate that it would reach out uh, to many other countries in the, in the world. Okay. We want to just thank uh, our guest today, Sam Philippe. He's a, a fine artist, sculptor in, here in Jerusalem, a real partner uh, for the Christian Embassy, not only uh, in some of the awards he designs for us, but we do certain charitable humanitarian uh, things with him and many other things. He's just been a great friend. And Jerry Klinger, the founder and president of the Jewish American Society for Historic Preservation. Uh, he's the one when you go around and see historic monuments and markers, and uh, th this is uh, his job. That, uh, but uh, well, right, right. Um, uh, yeah, not only in America, but he's he's branched out into many areas, helping us remember the past. It's very uh, you know something we Christians can learn from our Jewish friends and brothers about uh, to remember. It's a the, the biggest command in the Bible, the most oft-repeated re command in the Bible is remember, remember. And we just have to thank Jerry for the initiatives he's taken 
to help us honor some of these Christian figures. Even uh, we haven't even mentioned Lord Balfour, James Arthur Balfour, the, uh, the, who, who uh, you know deserves credit for the Balfour Declaration, Britain's commitment to help rebuild a Jewish state in the land. Jerry found his gravestone and found out it was um, unattended. No one really cared about it. No one knew where it was. And he's uh, that he was uh, really put together a wonderful ceremony in honor of Balfour there in, in London uh, several years ago. We just thank you both for your partnership. Uh, the, the endeavors we do with you can't say enough about it. We thank everyone for joining us here on this Israeli Independence Day. A happy uh, Yom Hatzma'ut once right. again to, to everyone. We just say a prayer, Lord. We pray for a great year ahead for Israel. And I uh, and want to invite everyone back next week uh, to the ICEJ webinar next Thursday, 4 p.m. here on this same place. Thank you for joining us and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feliz Dia de la Independencia, Israel! Bonne fête d'indépendance Israël. Happy Independence Day, long live Israel. Israël. Independence Day, Israel. Israel, herzlichen Glückwunsch zum Unabhängigkeitstag. Ein gesegnete Unabhängigkeitstag, Israel. Manigaya Aro Nakaleya an Israel. Israel, Tuli Chinyeri, Hello! Waka Nui Nui Vinaka, Ni Singa, Ni Tuba Kaikoya, E Israeli. Hiva, Itzenesis, Taiva, Israel. Sotantra Divaski, Shubaka Maniye, Israel. We love you, we stand for you.